Hello, and welcome to Cry Havoc Wargaming, dedicated to bringing you the uncommon. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Ron, and today we're going to be doing a review of Burrows and Badgers by Oathsworn Games. So let's get started. Burrows and Badgers is an interesting game. Very, very popular in, in Britain. I don't know that it's as popular here. It's sort of a peculiar genre, I think, for here. And that is that it is an anthropomorphic animal game. It's a fantasy setting set in a sort of fantasy Northumbria uh, in Britain. Uh, medieval technology mostly. Well, a weird blend, actually, of, of medieval and early 18th century. Half the characters look like uh, highwaymen. Um, some of them are armed with, with firearms. But what the figures all have in the similarity to all the characters of the game is they are all animals. Lots of mice and huge barbaric badgers, dogs and flying animals, you know, various birds, occasional lizards, just all sorts of little animals, incredible sculpts uh, made by the, uh, the creator of the game, by Oathsworn. And you're free to create bands however you like. They do sort of follow certain genres. There's a, a royalist faction. There are the free beasts or, or revolutionary faction. There are outlaws, rogues uh, faction. There are the wildlings, the wild animals, sort of. I, I went with a Scottish theme with mine, uh, the, the clan. But that's about it, unifying-wise. Uh, any of the creatures in the game, they... The figures are created with professional classes. You know, you'll buy a, a badger ranger, but there's no badger ranger in the game. There's a badger, but it's up to you to give them the weapons and then build them towards learning skills that give them what they should have for the various sort of professions. So any character in the game can be whatever you want them to be. Any character in the game can be a mage in the end, because that's just a skill, a situation of paying points. Or in the game, it's all pennies. It's all Northumbrian pennies. You start the game basically in, in a zero level sort of function with a 350 penny to spend on your band, which is going to be usually about five to six figures. They rate them two ways. They rate them on the expenditure of monies, and they rate them by what they call a war band value. Uh, and so that's if you have, if you spent all your pennies buying a unit of badgers, badgers are big, huge characters with these extra abilities and strengths, and they're, they're very fearsome and can be little tanks in the game. So that group is going to cost or have a higher war band rating, which will affect other things in the game. It's, it sort of balances it out. There's no requirement that all of your creatures be the same, but sometimes you can get advantages or bonuses if they are all the same. And there's only a few species you can't do that with because a handful of the species being non-British beasts are rare and can't be doubled up on that. Things like um, the marmots, for instance. I have a marmot and Marmots aren't indigenous to the area, and they're, they're therefore rare. Armadillos are rare. The game consists of a number of different stats. The, if I've heard a complaint about the game, it's based on that. There are a lot of stats. A friend of mine has complained about the fact that there's so many stats and how that's hard all to remember, but you don't, you don't remember it. You have a, a sheet that has all your characters on it. Cards would be nice, uh, and that would be an easy thing to do on your own, to have little cards for the individual characters as, as you've proceeded. The game is very much like a, a number of popular skirmish games right now. It, it, it's very similar to Frostgrave, where you have a little band of guys, you go around and you do things, and the game is played over their lifetime of their career, gaining benefits um, through uh, their survivability, through their adventures and their campaigns. So very similar in that role. It is more complicated, I would argue, than Frostgrave. Um, the stats are things like your ranged ability, your combat staff, your presence. So a lot more stats than, than some games have, but I don't find it that confusing. The game can certainly be proved on by use of tokens. My understanding is the author of the game doesn't really like tokens, so there haven't been any official products for that. But that's easy enough to find tokens that you find useful for other games that you could invite or bring over for the game. Uh, at least one person has created a sheet of PDF of tokens that are available on the Burroughs and Badgers Facebook group on, on Facebook. Um, I find that the tokens are really of value and very additional. And if you don't like the tokens on the board, and I understand that, and a lot of people don't, the tokens can be put right on the character sheet or if you made cards on your cards and kept off the table if you wanted to go that route. The game is a game based on initiative, a game where you move a character, your opponent moves a character, and you alternate 
when you activate a character, they only get one action. Um, in a way that's a little confusing to try to teach. It's not a lot of difference than most games that give two actions. They just have a move included in most actions. If you take a shoot action, you get a, a movement and then you get to shoot. So you're really, in any other game, it would be two actions and a move shoot. If you don't decide to move, if you just do the shoot, then you get a bonus as if you aimed, which would have been another action in another game. So it's a very similar feel in that to what you're used to in other games. The neatest feature of the game to me is the way they rate these different creatures and make them act and feel like different creatures is they use several different dice for determining the stats. They're not all D10s. It's not based on a D10 system. You might have D4, D6, D8, whatever. Uh, in this game, it's only one, typically, unless you do something additional, like spend your fate points, give you additional dice, and we'll talk about fate points, because that's a, one of the strategies of the game. But normally, you have just your die roll. Now, that sounds like it could be disastrous, but there's a really neat built-in balancing mechanism to the game, and that is... Uh, say you only have a D4 in a skill. I can't remember if D4s are even used in the game, but let's say they are. Anytime you roll the maximum number on a die that you can, you add seven to your total. And that's what you're doing, is you're comparing your roll to your opponents. So if I'm fighting against a dog with a D8, if, and I roll a D4, obviously if I roll a four, it's not going to be able to beat half of what he'll roll on a D8. But because it's the max number, because it's a four, I'll actually add a seven. So that would count as an 11. This happens on any of the dice rolls. Any die roll you roll, if you roll the maximum number, you add seven to it, but it gives the advantage to the little guys to make up for the automatic disadvantage that usually he's gonna be beat by the bigger dice guy. But he always has a chance. That mouse can always end up getting that killing blow in on a badger uh, if he happens to roll well. So that's, that's brilliant. Kind of like Frostgrave, the, the damage is going to be caused by the difference in most cases, or your success, I should say, because it's not always damage. But usually the success of your roll is based on how far you beat your target number by. Now, I mentioned the fate points. In most cases, any of these um, war bands will begin with 10 fate points. And I say most cases because um, some of the uh, factions can get two additional. And the fate points are used whenever you like. You can expend a fate point. They don't ever come back. You only have 10 for the game, but you can expend them to roll extra dice, so increasing your inches of success. You don't add them together or anything. You just take the result of the higher dice. So that's a pretty cool, I think, mechanic as well. The game's mechanics are actually really good. Uh, for what would strike you offhand as a pretty silly game, it being mice and squirrels. And and it is silly, don't get me wrong. There's things that add to the silliness, like the shrew zerker. There's a mole seer. So there is a lot of humor in the game. The game is meant to be a little tongue-in-cheek, but the rule system is really a little more serious than you might expect for such a silly game. This game is fun. It's really enjoyable. As an American, it's a little more expensive, you know, because it's, it's all imported. Oathsworn is a small company. There aren't distributors, so you're buying the figures for from him. There are a few other companies that do figures that might work for the game. There's some mice from Reaper. Dark Sword does beautiful characters. The problem is, and I didn't get into this, all of the animals in uh, Burrows and Badgers are rated by their size, and their base size goes up for that as well. So they take more room on the table, and there's a difference in their appearance on the tabletop. Uh, and unfortunately, if you're using animals from other companies, they may or may not fit well within that. Like Dark Sword, it, as long as you're dealing with a medium or smaller uh, uh, animal, you're probably okay. Where you start getting into danger is like, they're, they do a beautiful badger, but he's really small compared to the badgers that are made officially for the game. I really would recommend this game. I think it's a lot of fun. It's not obviously for the serious uh, war gamer, the historic war gamer, but it's a nice change of pace. A friend of mine has, I don't think he ever got around to it, but he intended to play it with his daughter. Brilliant choice on that. For any fans of books like um, the Red Wall series, which I imagine inspired it. Nice change of pace, good feel. You can already use terrain you probably have if you play any medieval war gaming or fantasy war gaming at all. Real easy to use stuff or interchange it, but there are a number of companies that produce terrain specifically for the game. Uh, Cerisa comes to mind immediately. They do a number of uh, uh, buildings for it. There's a, at least one building that's done by Black Sight Studios. A little bit of support on that score as well, but the game does not take much. So, yes, 
I rate the game pretty highly. I would recommend it. I think it's a, a very enjoyable game. I'm pretty invested in it. I have already f four different war bands, and I've participated in a couple of the uh, Kickstarters. So uh, I'm, I'm clearly a supporter of the game. Uh, if you uh, have any questions about the game, or if you play Burrows and Badgers yourself and would like to make comments regarding the game, please do that in the comment section down below. Also, if you uh, have any ideas for further content you'd like to see presented here on uh, Cry Havoc Wargaming, we look for those in the comments down below. Uh, in fact, I, I would have covered Burrows and Badgers eventually anyway, but it was recommended to me by my, uh, my good friend Andrew France. So um, uh, this is an example, sort of, of us following along on that line. Uh, if you have uh, enjoyed the video and if you have found it at all useful, I hope that you'll hit like. And if you'd like to receive further notification regarding videos like this one that might help you decide how to better spend your money or time in your wargaming hobby, then please hit subscribe and ring our bell. Until next time, cheers.